So hello everybody and welcome to this video in which we're going to step in a time machine and fly back to Paris 1853 and even a little bit before. But before we do that I want to give you a clarification. This is not a video to quote unquote prove to you that Chopin should be played on a clavichord or a harpsichord. Far from that. I I've recorded the Mazurkas Opus 56 recently on my clavichord here and I will link the video here on the icon, I icon, if you click on that you will, that will link you to that video if you're interested to hear the result of that. I've recorded that just as a kind of experiment, mostly because in Sweden you had actually clavichord building companies who built the clavichords up to 1840 that late and those instruments they were bigger than mine my instrument has five octaves those instruments often had six octaves and actually we don't know much about what people were playing on those instruments and since Chopin was a big name it was worth my time I thought of playing Chopin and I have played a lot of Chopin in the past on my Irar piano here. But of course there is no doubt that Chopin composed the majority of his works for the Pleil piano which he admired very much. But before that of course there were other periods and it's always, in, always interesting to, if we look to an historical person, historical figure, to put him in a kind of context and take him actually out of the box in which history likes to place people. We today look back to those persons. We look back to Chopin, for instance, and we see in him the composer who played on the playel pianos. But of course, there was a Chopin who was younger. There was a Chopin who went to Vienna. He preferred in Vienna uh, the Konrad Graf instruments. Actually, he composed um, quite some etudes there amongst others the famous C major etude was composed in fact for a Viennese piano and not for the playel piano not saying that you cannot play that piece on a playel piano far from but he made an evolution and there was even a Chopin before that because in Vienna you had these also by then fancy pianos that he actually played upon uh, but when he was younger he Probably, and I don't think that there has been done much research, but I don't know, maybe there is, and if you know about it, I'm happy to read in the comment section what kind of instruments actually he played on when he was very young. I have one letter in which I've uh, read, um, in this edition is very interesting by the way, and it is a Dover edition with a selection of his letters in English by the way, where he writes uh, at a very young age that he is not sending his clavicembalo rubbish to of uh, these mazurkas to his friend because he uh, has no time to send them. So clavicembalo is an interesting term, diving up in the term, it's definitely not a piano um, it is very clavichord related but we're going to talk about that in a minute. Let us skip a little bit here, not to make this video five days long and go to 1844 because that's an important moment on that moment, actually in that year, in December of that year, there is a young pianist with the name of Telfsen, Norwegian pianist, who was uh, searching or was actually trying to get some lessons from Chopin. And Telfsen was already two years in Paris. He had some lessons with other people, very much related to the Kalkbrenner school. And, but his final goal was to have lessons with Chopin. Now, that was very difficult. In, that, in those days, Chopin was really at his high day as a teacher, and typically he would refuse almost all students. But Telfson played for him and he was accepted as a student. And he would develop maybe as one of the most influential Chopin students um, that he had. You have, of course, Mikuli, who made, was a, a very good student of uh, Chopin, who made the edition, very good edition. You have Georg Matthias, who was maybe one of the most gifted pianists who studied with um, Chopin. But Delfson is a little bit of an unknown name, and that is a bit of a shame, because he is a really important, interesting and important figure in the life of Chopin. So in December 1844 they um, agreed that they would have let that Chopin would teach him and actually a funny story that we read in a kind of diary by Telson that Chopin asked him after the lessons well where do you live and 
Delft and said, well, there I live. And Chopin said, well, I want to have a look for myself. And so they stepped in Chopin's personal coach and they drove to that uh, place. And Delft, of course, as a young pianist, he was completely... Um, uh, he couldn't speak uh, anymore because he was thrilled by the fact that the great Chopin was near to him. And imagine that for a moment that you or I would be in his position. I mean, that would that's just something you can reflect and you can fantasize on forever, I think. But anyway, um, Chopin would have said, they would, and, and the coach right, would, would have taken his hand in his both hands and said, you Norwegian people or you people of the North, you have a special way of, of, of uh, expressing your emotions, which is completely fine. So he put him at ease, I think. So and he controlled or he visited the place where Telfson lived. So a very interesting story. That Mr. Telfson, he stayed with Chopin a few years and he would turn out not to, only to be a very good student of his, he would carry on the tradition of Chopin, but he was very close to him as a friend as well. So at the... At the last years, the last years of Chopin, when his star, so to say, declined a little bit, and we could make a video on that and several because that's not that's not without a reason. That's in the context of the time. It's very understandable why that happened. So he went on tour in England and Scotland with Jane Sterling. That's also famous, a student uh, of Chopin who had actually an eye on Chopin, but it were, didn't work out both ways. Um, and Telfson accompanied. Chopin on that trip. Also, when Chopin was really on his deathbed, he said to his sister who was there that he would like Delfson, so his student, to finish his unfinished piano school. And by the way, if you would like to read that school, and we will make some other videos on this because it's an interesting book when the piano is here. As Quis pour me tot the piano, it's in French, but you'll find the translation of that draft of Chopin's piano school in this book, Chopin, Pianist and Teacher, as seen by his pupils by Eigeldinger. If you have some time, just buy this book and sit in your sofa and read this because you will find almost all quotes that are there, all stories, all background of people talking about Chopin, their experience with Chopin. This is gold, a golden book, really. The only thing is, it doesn't contain Telefson's story. Um, that's only in the French edition. So Chopin gave the manuscript, the draft manuscript of his piano method to um, his sister with the with the question to give it to Telfson to finish it. And now Telfson did, um, wrote actually did several chapters, but he didn't finish it on his turn. But reading that makes you really understand, I think, the key aspects of Chopin's piano method, his, his teaching method, and also his way of playing. But again, that's for another video. We're coming to the point where I want to guide you to, which is that point in 1853. So now we're stepping out of our time machine three years after Chopin's death. We are now 20th of December 1853 and Delfson gave a concert in Paris, which we have a review of. And that's not something remarkable. The thing is that Delfson didn't give a lot of concerts. He was also in that respect in the tradition of Chopin. And also there you have a context in which the old school actually didn't function but anymore but for a very happy few a very small circle and very briefly that's because of the introduction of the mechanical playing people were, were practicing in a different way the younger generation they speeded up everything they played more mechanical which caused actually an older generation motionless list also i believe but also Chopin, I really believe that he had, of course, health problems, but he didn't fit in that school of virtuosity, which we today, looking back again, not looking from what was before them, but just looking back, we take those generations, Moschlis, Liszt, uh, Mendelssohn, uh, Schumann uh, and Chopin with the virtuosic generation, which I believe was happening only in the second half of the 19th century, but that between brackets, Delfson, played for a very uh, for, a, for a few people a few times a year and not more and in this concert we do have a review by and i take my paper it is a review um, published in the review et gazette musicale de paris so and there the the person who writes the the review he says that uh, belson played on a clavecin 
So we would say a harpsichord, but we're going to cover that. We're going to talk about that in a second. But the quote is, on the clavecin, he played, of which the construction, and that's my translation, of which the construction goes back one century, and that belonged to Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. Mr. Telfson played some fugues by the famous Sebastian Bach. Now, if I start a little bit for context around that, what exactly could be meant by that, I came in, uh, I found the proceedings of a Lausanne festival recently, or uh, recently in 2004, by a certain Ingrid Dallacker, who spent a lot of time researching the life of Telf since he wrote even the biography of his life. And I will read, I will quote exactly what she writes. It's also my translation because it's written in French, published in French. One would wonder, Ingrid Dallacker writes, if the reference to the instrument, and by the way, she's quoting, she's commenting on this same quote in which Telfson is being described as playing on um, a, a clavecin fugues by Bach, a clavecin that belonged to C.P.E. Bach. Um, I don't think you have to understand that literally they meant that as an instrument as known by C.P.E. Bach. So she writes on that, com on that quote, one would wonder if the reference to the instrument of C.P.E. Bach was not meant to be a clavichord from the hand of Heinrich Johann Söderström, an instrument that he could have taken with him and which was still in use very much in Sweden. So Mrs. Dallacher presumes that Delfson took a clavichord to Paris. And if I then come back, and I will continue that story a little bit in, in, in a minute, but if I, if I go back to the term clavicembalo, remember the beginning of this video where Chopin writes uh, to his friend, well, I don't want to send you my clavicembalo rubbish because I don't have any time, something like that. If I then take, for instance, this book, this is a dictionary, um, and again, guys, there's nothing to prove, but just to, to, to take a broader context, this is actually the Musique Lexicon by Hugo Riemann. I don't know which edition it is. This has many editions. This was kind of standard work. This is an edition in 1894, so a little bit later. But if you then go and search for Clavicembalo, what that means, that's actually written under the, under the name or term of Clavicin. So clavecin, which we would assume. But if I read then what he writes, clavecin, he says, Francaise is French, means clavicembalo. Ah, the same, the same term. And then he said, means clavichord. In German, clavier. That's very important. Not saying that that's the only truth, but this is a clue that Mrs. Mrs. Dallacher could be right in the sense that Tellefsen would maybe have take, has taken a clavichord that belonged to him and that was just in Paris, maybe even as a practice instrument. Who knows that at the beginning of his time there, he couldn't afford a piano. That's very well possible. Before we come to the last part of this video, which is a kind of fantasy part, but I like that because it opens sometimes these historical figures out of their boxes and fantasizing, I don't mean fantasizing like science fiction, just putting things in the context and and reflect on what might have, have has happened. We should not forget that in this time, the Bach revival was really at the high point. Um, the Bach revival, starting already with his son, C.P.E. Bach, for sure, uh, Forkel was a gigantic figure in that. We underestimate that today really a lot. Going to cover that in the future as well. So then you have Kriepenkerl, that culture of, and that led to Mendelssohn, of course, with his famous uh, Matthias Passion uh, execution, which really um, took this to a global scale at the time. So we've seen in the video on, on, on Chopin how he played Bach. He used Czerny edition. Um, it copied everything. It took Czerny as, as a real a source for performing Bach, but this all needs to be seen in this big Bach revival so that Telfson plays fugues by Bach on a concert was something fashionable, that he did it on an old instrument was something remarkable, and that he did that on maybe a clavichord was something that's maybe astonishing. But imagine that it was a clavichord and go back to that moment in 1844 where Telfson actually describes how Chopin wanted to see where he stayed. That clavichord then, that he might have used in the 1853 concert, was in his apartment. And I cannot imagine that if Chopin would have seen that instrument, he would not have tried it. The more 
that there are reasons to believe that in his youth, in his young years, that he knew such instruments. Of course, not these big ones, if Telson had an instrument like that, but the clavicembal, which he's referring to in his letter, might be a clavichord more than a harpsichord, which even then was still a very expensive or rare instrument. So, not saying that I know this, but just imagine that, clav that Chopin played on clavichord a few chords. And the connection that he must, the touch that he had with the instrument, we will never know. We do know that Chopin played very soft on piano, that uh, maybe a little bit exaggerated, but that you had to put your ears near the hammers to hear him, that his forte sound was something that other would call piano, and that he whispered with the hammers of the piano, barely touching the strings. Well, this, evo this evocation of silence, that's what the clavichord really makes pow powerful, not that the clavichord should sound soft, but it can just approach what we call silence, and maybe that Chopin played on it and smiled a little bit and enjoyed it. Of course, not having one hair on his head, thinking on taking this instrument as a main instrument, because that was not the ideal of this Bach um, revival. They didn't think about going back. They looked back, they tried things out, more perhaps than we think today, but of course they, made, they, they went forward and what was new, most of the time they considered to be better. Also Telfson, also Chopin, and actually, almost all historical figures. So that was something uh, that I thought was worthwhile sharing with you. And um, it's a little bit of a long video, I know, because there is a lot of context to be given and we have touched upon several items here that, well, I could dive in with you for hours and hours like the piano method of Chopin. Once the piano is here, things will be covered and we will expand a little bit maybe beyond, beyond Beethoven as well. Who knows, because Chopin really close to my heart so anyway thank you for watching and if this is your first time here on authentic sound love to have you subscribe this channel is all about exploring the music from Bach to Beethoven and now we are with Chopin everything to inspire you on your journey as a musician or as a music lover and if the concept here on the channel with Monday videos where I perform myself and these Wednesday videos I share some thoughts with you on Friday we have inspiration videos with works played by others on my vinyl collection CD collection or whatever I find on the World Wide Web to, to share with you if that concept, concept appeals to you please hit that subscribe button it's completely free and then we see each other very soon again. Bye.